two, um, the, the management and representation class has great invested in regarding the artist as an unfortunately necessary parasitic <laughs> adjunct uh, to the writer's creative dream. And three, the standards of reading has plunged so rapidly in the United States that you have 55-year-old men reading the same shit they were reading when they were 15, and in desperate, in desperate need of having a, a slather of gravitas applied to what is basically a junk into 15-year-old boys. Akin to what I would do if I were to give them to get the rights to do Curious George and take Curious George and the Man the Yellow Hat back to Africa to fight the Ebola epidemic. <laughs> Wait a minute, let me write that down. <laughs> And By the way, I am working on a musical version of the Time Machine because I was, I, I, whatever, I the next one. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Hey. Uh, this afternoon we're talking about the pulp roots of comic books because somebody suggested it, it sounded like a good idea, and these gentlemen said, sure, why not? I'm a cheap date. <laughs> yes. None of, not, what, these are some notes. Let me, can I say? You may look at my notes, sure. Okay. Alright, um, since he's reading my notes, why don't we start with introductions on my right hand, just to see, make sure everybody knows the, all the players. Sir? Oh, we have to introduce ourselves? Sign in, enter and sign in, please. What are you here for, then? To ask the questions he's reading. You know, that's a... <laughs> he's Mars, got, he's got you questions. You keep asking me tough questions. Ron, is, Ron is, the metaphysical panel is next. <laughs> um, hi, I, I'm Paul Levitz. I, I am not old enough to have read pulps when they were actually coming out or to be a pulp root of comics, but I'm happy to be talking about the topic. I wrote a lot of comics, edited some of, a few of them, and uh, was nominally the publisher of way too many of them. Nominally? <laughs> wow. Stepping away from, the, from, from your body of work already, that's fantastic. No, I'm okay. happy, happy with the body of my work, I just don't... Quite know how to describe what, what you do as publisher other than you have your name on it as publisher. Right. Uh, identify. That was a very cat like disavowal, though. Yep. <laughs> uh, okay. All the blame, none of the credit. Fair enough. And you are? Uh, I'm Ron Mars. I wrote some comics and still do when they let me. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a friend of Bob's and a fellow Mets fan, so that's why he twisted my arm into doing this. Um, and left. I'm Howard Chaka. Um I'm a comic book artist and writer. I consider myself a cartoonist. Um, I, 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 oddly enough, before I got here, I, I was thinking about Pulse and how much I had no interest in them. And, but, but actually, Bob, in his notes, which I read while Bob was talking, um, actually acknowledges the existence of, of writers who I do, do take seriously. Um, when most people think of Pulse, they think of the shadow of Doc Savage and Justin Corbin, but actually he talks about the guys who are really important, like, like Bradbury, like Burroughs, like Hammett, like Chandler, and like, and like the Canes, Paul, and James M. Um, so yeah, they, I am that guy. But not that shadow stuff, not that Doc Savage. Well, <laughs> there's more to Pulse than just those characters, and I want to make sure at the outset we define our terms. Do, do, you know, because there's some people here who may know the term and not necessarily know what it really means. So let me give you a little bit of background. Pulp magazines refers to the cheap pulp wood paper that they were printed on. Um, the first cons uh, officially considered pulp magazines from 1896, a uh, publisher by the name of Frank Muncy, put out a, a magazine called Argosy. It had slick cover co color covers on um, this cheap pulp wood paper, it was not trimmed, if I recall right, so it had ragged edge and all. And for a dime, you got about 100 pages worth of um, straight fiction with some illustrations. And they were popular enough that they spanned multiple genres and lots of other publishers jumped in, uh, notably Street and Smith, uh, who gave us these popular characters that, that Howard is disavowing. And not disavowing. Not disavowing. Sorry. Uh, but there is Hugo Grinsback doing um, the beginning of what we consider today science fiction, hence the Hugo Awards. Um, we have these continuing char uh, character features that spun off into radio, movies, television, serials, and, and all, and obviously comic books. But also some of the people who were publishing these pop magazines wound up moving into comic books. And they, they're, so there's a lot of connections that people who are not historians may not know. So I think that's one of the reasons we're here to talk about 
those connections from the characters as well as uh, the creators. To that end, Paul, you can talk a little bit about some of those publishers. Sure. Um, well, I think there's a couple lenses you can, can look at this history through. One is that as readers, we tend to look at the things as very separate and discrete things. The dime novel, the pulps, the comics. But very often the business history of these different forms is very closely intertwined. And what you find when you look back at the roots of the comics, a great deal of the history of the comics, comic books in America as opposed to comic strips, comes from a period in the 1930s when a group of entrepreneurial characters, because they were pretty, pretty broad characters as individuals, were brought into contact with each other in New York through magazine publishing and magazine distribution and magazine printing. And before they were in comics, almost all of these people were in some piece of the creation or distribution of the pulp magazines. Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, who arguably created the first ongoing comic with new material, new fun, was a pulp writer, he was a syndicator of material for the pulps. The founders of the business enterprises that became the later version of DC Comics, Marvel Comics, Archie Comics, were all at one point or another in their lives working for the same magazine distribution company that was doing a lot of magazine distribution. The founders of DC were publishing the more risque or raunchy branch of the pulps. The founders of Marvel were publishing a series of pulps. These lives interconnected and overlapped in one fashion or another. And the people move from one business model to another as changes happen in the distribution system, or in particular in New York, as LaGuardia clamped down on pornography when he came into office as the mayor of New York. And that scared some of these guys into moving up. There were also a couple of publishers who were more sophisticated businesses, more established businesses like Street and Smith um, that became involved in the comics industry in one fashion or another. And publishers like Fawcett that said, oh, okay, if the comic stuff is working, let's add that to what our existing established healthy business is. Um, at the same time, you have a, from a very separate lens, you have the guys who were writing and drawing comics or would go on to write and draw comics, who were often growing up reading these, these pulps, very heavily influenced from them, borrowing from them, either honorably, intellectually, uh, in that they were influenced by the material that was in them, Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who grew up loving the science fiction material, um, sometimes borrowing and <coughs> wholesale. Uh, as we found over the years, you know, some of the earliest material in Batman was borrowed rather plagiaristically um, from some of the material in the shadow. I don't think that was a unique instance either in that, that period. Um, there was not a lot of belief in the early years of comics that anyone was creating great and lasting art or that this was important literary material. It was entertainment. So, okay, how do, we, how do we do this quick? How do we do this fast? How do we do this for the modest wage we can draw out of this? And let's have some, hopefully let's have some fun in the process. Okay, good, thank you. Um, there was also a bit of a revival of interest in some of the pulp material when paperback houses started to um, reprint 
the adventures of Doc Savage and the Shadow and some of the other characters in the 1960s. Uh, so you had a new generation of readers who then went on to enter the comic field, such as the gentleman to my left. I'm busy. I'm a 65-year-old man who's turned into a 15-year-old girl with the advent of this fucking phone. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's pathetic. Do you message in emojis yet? Oh god, I will not. That, that, I, I draw the line. <laughs> I thought you just drew the emojis. <laughs> but, well, I mean, I, I got an email from, from, a, from a comic book fan in, in Buenos Aires who's a really good guy who wants to know what he's in New York and he should, what, what should he see on stage. <laughs> so I'm suggesting Matilda or something rotten. Oh, it's, something rotten is wonderful. It's great, isn't it? And I yeah. saw it with an all, all, I saw it literally on the Thursday night in August. And it was all, it was 90% understudy cast. Oh, okay. And it was a fucking machine that was fantastic. It's vaudevillian and hysterical. The best new show since Matilda. I agree. Oh, so I lost that job over the original. Fuck that cast. waitress shit. It's just awful. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying, Bob, I'm sorry. Anyway, but as I recall, you were a voracious reader um, as, a, as a youth before you got into comics. I'm Romanian, yes. And you discovered a lot of these pulp. Uh, writers. Well, I've said more than once that the day before my bar mitzvah, um, I, had, I had German measles and thought they were hives. And I was, I was feverish and ill. And I went to the, to the newsstand, there were no new comics, but the Bob Abbott Valentine edition reprints of, of the John Carter of Mars stories was, were being come, coming out. They were 15 cents a pop. And I bought A Fighting Man of Mars, Tanhedron of Hastor, Death to Him. And um, I came home and sat on my stoop, and I read this book, and it was a transformative experience, like Saul on the road, on the road to Damascus. Um, it became the, the third linchpin of my career, which was drawing, one of them was drawing Nazi planes among my Hebrew school homework, playing with toy soldiers, or as we call them, army men. And Edgar Rice Burroughs changed my life. Um, he, he demonstrated that, you know, like, like, how long has this been going on? Oh my god, it was fantastic. Um, I really loved it, and I've read everything Burroughs wrote at least three times. And, right. it's and it, by the way, it's unreadable for anybody over the age of 16. <laughs> it is so awful. Just dreck. But Just, the ideas were so fresh yeah, at no, the time. No, well, fresh on because it, I can't really agree with that. No. <laughs> you argue with me. I think in 1912 when Tarzan showed up, there was nothing else like it. Sure, there was. There was Kim, there was Marvel, there was Mowgli. Um, okay. You know, um, but it doesn't matter. I mean, Burroughs, Burroughs had, like, like Nietzsche says, talent is conviction. Uh, Burroughs had enormous conviction because he was, he was, he had painted himself into a hole. He had nothing going on. He was, he was poverty stricken. Now, you know, he actually stumbles onto an idea. And for me, the Tarzan books are really second grade compared to the John Carter of Mars. Though those, those twelve books are utterly transformative. I saw, I saw John Carter in the movies twice in two days. Sitting, and I, I was sitting there with, for the first time with, with my wife, who was very patient with me, and the second time with a string of posse of lesbians who I'm very close to. And they kept telling me to shut up, because I was literally doing the 85-year-old the drunken guy in a the movie theater thing. Like, oh my god, the ninth ray! You know? Kento's so, um, can! I know you have a hard time visualizing this. But, um, the work transformed the way I think about my life. And then, then, then Howard, Robert E. Howard, and then Archie Goodman comes along and makes me read all the other guys. He makes me read Cabot, Chandler, uh, James F. Kane. And does anybody read Paul Kane? Anyone? Paul Kane mean anything to you? A novel called Fast One, not the Fast One, but Fast One. Dig it up. Trust me. He's a forgotten giant. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Now, Ron, you've been doing a lot of ERB stuff at Grace Burroughs. What's the appeal for you here? Uh, you know, I, I had the same childhood as Howard, except for the bar mitzvah part. Um, <laughs> it's I, not too late. No. <laughs> we take comforts. It doesn't hurt that much, I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the bar mitzvah doesn't come with a moil. <laughs> I think these days, to get, in, to get in late, Howie, you have to do the whole routine. Might be too late for me. Um, I. I you know, I had the same kind of transformative thing where I discovered uh, the Ballantine John Carter stuff when I was, you know, the, the golden age of science fiction is 12 years old. Uh, and that's when I found that stuff. And it hit me then and stuck with me ever since. Um, you know, I wanted to, from that point on, I wanted to grow up and be at Rice Rice Burroughs. Uh, and and again, much like Howard, I've read everything he's written. Uh, probably not three times, though. Maybe 
maybe just twice for most of it. Um, and, and now, you know, I, I wanted to grow up to write John Carter, and, you know, and it, and it took me 35 years to get there, but I finally got my chance to write John Carter <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to Dynamite. And, uh, you know, I, I would have done the job for free, but I didn't want Nicky to know that because he would have let me do it for free. <laughs> He's now virtual. Uh, but you mean you, but don't that, pay, you don't pay him to do it? He's really slipping. I, you know, I got to send him chocolates every once in a while. Okay. Um, but those those books, and I, and I and I agree with Howard again that it's you know they're not really good books, but if, if they hit you at the right age, they're what stays with you for the rest of your life. Like like to me, John Carter's the best thing in the world ever. For some of you guys, probably Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the best thing in the world ever because it hits you at the right age. And I look at it and go, well, that stuff's stupid. Who wants that shit? You know, just like my kids look at John Carter. You know, I, I, when the John Carter movie came out, my kids... Best said, movie ever made. My, my kids got a day off from school. Because we all went. Uh, which they regularly remind me of. Uh, but... That stuff fired my imagination, uh, and I think if I had not discovered it at the right time, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Um, and and to great extent, I you know I'm doing done some Tarzan stuff. I've done John Carter. I'm doing some uh, some Sunday style strips on the Edgar Rice Burroughs website. Uh, one with Rick Leonardi, one with Lee Motor. Um, mostly because I feel like I owe a debt to that guy that I never met, that I can never repay. And if even just a couple of people rediscover his work and get something even remotely out of it like I did, that, that I have a responsibility to, to do that stuff. The Pulps gave us these larger than life characters that got their own titles, that were very popular. The Shadow was so popular it was coming out twice a month. Um, and yet, so many of these characters did not translate well to four-color comics through the years. Why do you think that might be? Jesus, he's sitting right here. <laughs> I didn't say his run of the shadow. I just said, commercially, some of these characters have not performed well. Actually, I, I, well, while we were sitting here, I was thinking about it. And really, Howard's, Howard's shadow was kind of the one, the one kind of high point of taking those characters into comics that's that's really looked back on. Finally, most of it hasn't worked, and I, I, I'm kind of sitting here wondering why. Well, I, I have a, I, have a, I mean, I, I, well, I, yeah. I, I don't necessarily agree. Um, the reality is that the, my first awareness of the Shadow were the, were the two feature films, not the Victor Joy, but the Clean Richmond ones. Hmm. Um, they were on Channel Five in New York City, and they, and they fascinated me. And um, they were, they were 60 minute longs. They were B pictures, bottom, bottom Bs, and, um, and I really dug them. And when I finally tried to read this stuff, it was just they were, they were in, the novels were utterly incoherent. <laughs> and um, and I was asked to, to do the adaptation material after Michael Kaluta had done them. And back in those days, Kaluta's, Kaluta's work was I mean, Kaluta's work on the Shadow was pretty astonishing. I mean, Ma Michael is an, an amazing talent. Um, and I'm I came in I was the youngest guy in my generation, the least talented and the least skilled. And I had to learn how to do what I do, and I did. I taught myself because I and I because I felt I had to compete with these fuckers who were really naturally skilled, and I I, I beat their asses. And, um, and by the time the shadow was offered to me, Jordana offered it to me on the assumption that I liked this sort of material, and it also didn't tell me that it was already on the schedule. So while my while my while my belongings were being moved into my house in California, I was drawing the poster. I, my, I literally took my drawing table out and assembled it so I could do the cover, which became the poster, while they were moving into my house. Lamont Cranston, or Kent Allard, is a man born in the late 19th century, which means that he was a racist, a sexist, a bigot, an anti-Semite, and a member of the who was the archetype of white privilege. Um, which is but, but he had some bad qualities too, right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Spoken like a man, like a man who understands that you know you really don't need under roofs, you know. Um, but yeah, but but you know, but tr but that's the guy. That that's who that man would be. And there were a number of writers of some repute in 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 in, in, in the world of, of fiction and science fiction who took me to task for for, for having that, that that aspect of his character portrayed. Um, fuck him. Um, it's, it seems fair to me that if you're going to impose contemporary ethos and morality on, 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 on material, you're going to, if you're going to do, take, take this material seriously, which I find difficult to do at best, but to do it, 
Um, you have to take a look at the character, and you can't make him a fantasia, imposing your own modern values on a 19th century idea. I have an editor of DC Comics who constantly points out to me that one of the reasons I do period material is to be able to use racial epithets and, and slurs and pejoratives in a perfectly okay environment. And she's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'm, I'm very proud of the work they did in The Shadow. Um, because it pointed out that the character could be evolved and turned into a contemporary character. The reason that the shadow, that, that Batman and Superman are not viewed as nostalgic for, in, in, that, in that, that pulp nostalgia is that they survived 1949. The shadow was identified as a period character because it was canceled in 1949. It did not survive. If the shadow continued to be a run in the 50s and 60s, it would have turned into something more like what Don Pendleton was doing with the with the, with the, with the destroyer and the executioner. Sure. Something else would have evolved. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Um, but its failure, has created its milieu, okay? Now, The Rock is going to play Doc Savage in a movie written by and directed by Shane Black. What's that going to be like? I have no idea. I'm really kind of curious about it, okay? Is it going to be a contemporary piece? Is it going to be a period piece? I don't know. I'm, cur I'm, I'm more curious about that than any fucking Doc Savage novel that I've tried to read, you know, okay? And pretty much since, like, <clears throat> Gold Key's run of, of Tarzan in the 1960s, Tarzan has not been a commercial success in the United States. Um, anyone has attempted Doc Savage has not been a bestseller. Um, it, you know, these licenses bounce from publisher to publisher because there's a fondness for these characters. But why are they not connecting, do you think? Is it because they are of a time? Well, I mean, I think it starts with a couple of things. Certainly what, what Howie just said about the fact that they dead-ended at a certain date and didn't continue to evolve is critical. Um, because when you come back to a character after decades-long gap, even if you are empowered by your publishing company to reinvent, it doesn't feel like a seamless reinvention. It feels almost of necessity like you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That's one piece of the puzzle. The other piece of the puzzle is, I think, one of the major reasons that the John Carter movie didn't succeed commercially, regardless of how wonderful it may or may not be. I love the books. I did, didn't go, I did not go see the movie. That so many of the elements that Burroughs created that were original were brought to a mass audience in this generation in other media forms. They had been borrowed by other people. So Doc Savage as the Man of Bronze, well, we already know we got this Man of Steel guy who's been around who we grew up on. What's this bronze? That's not as interesting as that. The, the, the characters that have borrowed from what was there before have stolen away the magic of freshness and originality in some of those pieces. And that's a burden they take in the that's process. That's exactly right. Um, I, can, I can remember reading a uh, uh, review of John Carter that, that was very pissy about the, the big arena scene in John Carter because it was, it was you know, obviously cribbed from Attack of the Clones. <laughs> and I was just incensed that somebody reviewing movies like, had no sense of history and didn't know, well, this you know, didn't know states of cultural amnesia. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, yeah I think the... The, the modern audience that isn't familiar with this, this stuff has seen it in so many other packages. Yeah. Um, you know, John Carter is actually the most successful movie in history. They just called it Avatar. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> look, look, years ago, I was very close friends with a young studio executive when I was starting my career in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. and, um, this guy was a, a film student out of Texas. He's deeply informed. And he, showed, he, got, he got an answer print of Citizen Kane, a movie mm -hmm. he'd been talking about endlessly with his young colleagues, and showed it to him in the screening room. And these guys were bored out of their fucking minds by this movie. <laughs> they just fucking hated it. Because it was in black and white, and they'd seen every single trope that Wells introduced in 1939 used elsewhere. Because it had been picked up, gesundheit, use your sleeves, okay? Um, outside words. Um, and so the, 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 the freshness and, and what all the, the, the things, every single trope that, that Wells invented had been absorbed into the language. And, and the other thing, I mean, the two things that wrecked John Carter as, as, as a picture were A, the fact that Stone think, thought that everybody in the world was waiting for this movie, which was ridiculous, and B, Taylor Kitsch at no point in time ever read as anything other than a 21st century Canadian. Hmm. Um, he, was, he never convinced me at any point as a, member, as a man of the 19th century. Um, 
but but I, it's still the best movie I've ever made. I'm sorry. Kendo was killed. I think this. Uh, there's so another, danger. Uh, there's another piece to the puzzle that we contribute to as creative people as a challenge, and it's what how how he overcame on his shadow wonderfully. I haven't read Ron's work on the Burroughs characters, so I would trust that he managed to overcome it there as well. There are two reasons, generally, that creative people take on projects and comics that they put their all into. One is that it's an original character that they emotionally own, whether or not they legally have any ownership in it or not. The other is it's something they grew up on and loved, and oh my god, this is my chance to do Batman, Spider-Man, Sugar and Spike, you know, whatever the hell it is that they have passion about. Well, many, many of the creative people who came to do these characters came to it because they loved what it was, and they were trying to recreate a moment when they were 12, and they were no longer 12. And you combine that desire in their soul with often a licensor that says, no, 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 it must be done the way it always has been done. You must stay within the boundaries. That needs to be struggled against to find the essence of the character and tell, tell the story the way it would be told for a contemporary audience in a contemporary world. For Tarzan, I think that's an extraordinarily difficult problem. Have you seen the new film? I have not yet. Yeah. Has anybody seen the new film? Yes. Okay. Um, um, the most true, true to the original mid source material Thompson film in my memory. Hmm. Okay. I think ever. Here, I mean, maybe. It's very entertaining, too. Uh, it's, it's a, I mean, and I went in there expecting nothing. Um, because I, I, mean, I like both leads, but I didn't know quite what they were going to do with it. And they did a really nice job with it. It's, it's a terrific little movie. I don't think anybody saw it. Yeah. Well, by the numbers, nobody did. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, so I think those, those things contribute to the problem. You know, it's, it's a real challenge. Now, many of these characters continue to be contemporary, successful figures in comics or in prose stories in other countries. You know, Tarzan, not to, it's not just the gold key material, but Tarzan continued to be a very successful property in much of Europe for many years oh, yeah. af after it stopped being here in the US. Um, but yeah. we, we just haven't had someone who had the passion to make it work. Some of the material was beautiful. I mean, I think Joe Kubert's rendition of Tarzan was one of the, the truly lovely and faithful ones. Um, it came out at a moment when the comic book market was going to hell, and in particular where DC's ability to launch new material had gone to hell um, for a variety of reasons. Um, so it, it didn't didn't survive as an incarnation, but it's it's a real challenge to make this stuff work. Well, I, I think I was just thinking about Sherlock Holmes, which works to great extent as as an artifact of the era in which it was created, and yet it also works contemporarily. But I mean, for me, not as much. Is there about the Benedict Cumberbatch stuff? Yeah, yeah. It, you know the, that. That's a, and even the you know and even the House TV series. I hope I'm not spoiling anybody that you know House was actually Sherlock Holmes. Holmes <laughs> House. Um, Seriously. There, there's a there's that translates for whatever reason. Stuff like Tarzan doesn't. If you did a Tarzan movie, comic, whatever it is that was set contemporarily, it would it would be awful because we don't live in that world anymore. They Africa, did that on the CW and it failed. Africa is not that confident, not that continent anymore. I think you need a, a, a fantastic place for this stuff to take place in and the world's not a fantastic place anymore. We, we've ruined yeah, most of it. Uh, but for, for some reason, and I don't know why this is, homes can be picked up and carried and dropped somewhere else. Mm. Uh, which, which I don't find to be true of most of the stuff that we're talking about. Um, I don't uh, know that it, the, It's also fair that Holmes is the least fantastic of the yeah. characters. I mean, he has... But, I mean, I, I, mean I, I just recently started, only in the past year, started watching the Cumberbatch stuff. Because um, I watched the pilot years ago and I hated it and I came back under, under duress and I, and I like it. 
But it also, for me, points out the idiocy of the home novels, the home stories, because they're not, he's not really a detective. He pulls shit out of his ass. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's nonsense. I mean, the thing that, I mean, at least, I mean, and, and, and again, when, one of the things that Archie got me to read, he, he turned me on to the Nero Wolf stuff. Mm -hmm. And Wolf is, is, the, is specifically an attempt by Rick Stout to, to conflate the English cozy and, uh, and, and, and the American hard boiled language. And that, Wells, and, and, and that Wolf is, as we all know, Red Wolf is actually Sherlock Holmes' the illegitimate son. Um, and he does exactly the same thing, pulls shit out of his ass. It's not really detective novels. It's like, um, I mean, the, until recently, the best thriller writer alive was a guy named Stephen Hunter. He used to be the film critic of the Baltimore Sun. And, and this guy, in the first five or six of his novels, in, featuring Bob Lee Swagger, was a, they, they were school book demonstrations of expository, expository material buried in ex, buried exposition with payoffs. Point of impact, the, the TV series, is good, the movie's just awful. But the novel, Point of Impact, is a lesson in how to write thriller material where you're setting your material up, bury your exposition, and pay off every single point over a hundred page experience. It's brilliant. It's, it is, it's the most perfect diagram of the thriller I've ever read. This guy doesn't cheat. The home stuff cheats endlessly. That, I mean, I, the, the modern stuff lost me the third season when he came back from the dead. That was just utter bullshit. But, yeah, I, I, and I wasn't willing I, to stretch with him. And, I, and you know, there are look, there are there are absurd concepts that I'll stretch for. But I, I think we're more accepting of that stretch when it's in another era. Okay, I'll buy that. All right, you know. All right, okay. Yeah. And again, I'm not quite certain of why that is, but but I'll you know. I'll go with it if it's fog shrouded streets in London in 1898. Yes, where I'm there. I'm, I'm, I'm in your in, absolutely. Yes. Whereas if it's you know if it's if it's Times Square now, Jesus, sorry, you're a beloved figure, um, or I owe somebody money, one or the other. Um, you owe money to other beloved figures. That's good. It's Fred Van Lente uh, talking about the baseball game. Um, the important shit. Right? Yeah. Oh, so each each time this is making the noise, somebody scored a home run. Uh, apparently. Um, good night for the Orioles. We we say hit a home run, but okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> wow, patronizing shit for 200, Alex. That was amazing. Fuck you. I, I'm on Paul's behalf, on my client's behalf. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, is is that a? Remember, we're old enough that you know the Mets really were shit. I, we were growing up. I so. was on the qu campus of Queens College when they won the World Series that year, and watching these guys who were not—they were—they were, you know, basically. Yeah, devotees of the Maharishi, these guys are transcendental meditators who had been sitting with the, with the Mets since they were nine, turned into themselves at 11. <laughs> you know, but I'm just like, these, these, these guys who were spiritual godheads became hitters. They saw hit, say hitters, well, they don't say hitters, they know what you're talking about. Just hoodlums for the Mets for 20 minutes. But fuck that Sorry. Digression up here. So, you. so here, so here's the thing that I'm thinking is that most of the pulp stuff works in the era in which it was created and doesn't work in eras beyond that. I think, except for your shadow stuff. That's very kind. Um, I, cause I, because I can't think of anything else that's really. Well, it's also because I shit all over the original material, according to a number of writers of something <laughs> Um Who I will not name because I will not dignify them by, by, by their acknowledgement. You know who they are. If you don't ask me later, I'll tell you later. I'm not doing, I'm not doing it while I'm being recorded. No, I think I think you also have some of that parallel challenge with the the spirit, you know, which is which doesn't oh, yeah. come out of the yeah. pulp, but is very heavily influenced oh, by yeah. it. True. You know, the, you you look at the original material, and there's so much there that, like like you said about Citizen Kane, at the time, holy shit, you know. What, what Will was doing was just leaps ahead, but the tropes have been used a thousand times right. since. Well, I mean, you can trace the origins of comic book storytelling with resources. It's Will Eisner, um, Harvey Kurtzman, and Kirby Lee. And Eisner owned the 40s. You know, he was the architect. Mm -hmm. he, I mean, he, he created everything, you know. And that's me being generous to someone who, with whom I did not have one of those stellar relationships. <laughs> no. uh, All right, so. Since the, the panel title is Roots of the Comics, we've talked a lot about the characters. Let's talk about some of the, the 
people behind it, referring to the people who were the publishers who then went into comics, but also some of the editors, because you have people like Mark sure. Weisinger and Jack Schiff coming out of um, the public. Standard. What? Particularly coming out of Standard. Right, coming out of the public to edit the, the comic material. So what, what did Wheeler Nicholson and Goodman and Schiff and company bring to comic storytelling, character development, whatever? Thoughts? I, you know, I think, I think they brought an efficiency. When you look at the early American comics, comic books, um, they're a miracle on several levels. One is that the work had some level of passion when it was done as quickly and as cheaply as it was. The creative people were very poorly paid and were very inexperienced by the Lord. And yet there's things there that made magic that affected our culture for many years. It had to be done very, very efficiently. I think it's also generally extremely efficient storytelling in that they learn from the short stories in the poems, from the O. Henry logic, um, as one of the, the great writers of, the, of that time, how to tell a story that had an impact in really very few words and very few scenes. Um, all of E.C. descends very much from O. Henry and that kind of pulp logic. Uh, all of E.C. except for Harvey's stuff. Except for Harvey's. And even Harvey has a, has a lot of it. He just transcends it in some places. Yeah, but, no, but Harvey, Harvey was, was an outlier. I mean, um, all, all of Felstein and, and Gaines' stuff, certainly. Yeah. Um, but Harvey really, I mean, very rarely sank to that level. He was, and he was, he was a separate entity entirely. And, and a difficult guy, but still. Well, one of the geniuses. A genuine genius. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't disagree with your argument about the seminal, the seminal talents of the business in terms of establishing the storytelling rules. There's little bits and pieces of many other people, but those, those three combinations just shine so far above the rest. Um, so much of the business culture came out of the pulps. You know, the reason I had a writing career Pulps paid such bad salaries that the deal was usually, we'll hire you as an editor, you can edit Doc Savage, but we can only afford to pay you half of what you need to live on. So you'll earn the other half freelancing, uh, you'll write a story from my pulp magazine every week. And by the way, I'm going to write one for yours because they ain't paying me much better. Well, when I came into comics in the 70s, that was still very much the business model. We were paying very modest salaries, and the expectation was that everybody would freelance at something. You would write, you would letter, you would paste up, you would color, you would do something. There was money to be made if you needed to make a better living. Not a great living, but a better living. And that culture has disappeared from comics by and large today. Somewhat for the good, and the people I think are generally paid better. Somewhat for ill, in that we got to learn an awful lot. I mean, in practical terms, if you were an assistant editor, you would probably learn how to write comics. And some of us turned out to be decent writers, and some of us didn't. Um, but you had tremendous opportunity. So some of that kind of culture came into the field as well. Uh, some things for ill, the idea of just paying generally on flat, <coughs> flat fees and not having any kind of royalty or reward structure for people whose material succeeded because in the pulps there was no belief that any one writer particularly mattered very much and that really followed over into comics. It was all tonnage work. And even so, a lot of the comic book, I'm sorry, a lot of the pulp writers, a number of them wound up coming to comics where the pay was no better, if possibly worse. Yeah, we've turned up a couple of letters. Tony Collin is one of the big historians of the pulp era, has turned, turned up some letters from some of the guys like Otto Binder, mm -hmm. who wrote both pulps and, and comics, where from Binder's perception, the comics paid better. Um, 
this is not to say the comics paid well, but the time it took him to write comics, he could make he could make more money at that moment than he could writing pulps. Um, Walter Gibson, who was the lead writer on The Shadow for most of the years, I think had the reverse experience. He wrote a few comics, and he was really happy docking out the prose at an astronomic rate. So I think the comics may have had a little less prestige than the pulps, because they had pictures and therefore we presumed to be read more by illiterates than the pulp. Um, but I don't know that they were a lot lower on the economic food chain for the people. Okay. Is there anything we can still learn from the pulps today as storytellers or as readers? No. Okay. <laughs> I think we're the wrong ones to ask. I don't know that, yeah, are there any 12 year olds in the room? I think yeah. that's. I, 12 year olds don't read the same things or with the same enthusiasm that we did. Uh, I've. You know, I've got grandchildren, and I have friends with, with, with kids of that certain age, and, I, and I've introduced them to the Burroughs stuff. They're more interested in the fantastical, and frankly, they're not, they're not, they're not people who read, um, they, they read in packs, they're herd readers, they're not really, they're, they're not outlying readers. I mean, I was, nobody else was reading the shit that I was reading when I was reading this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they read Harry Potter, they read Harry Potter-related material, they read stuff like that. Um, and very few of them read, read for actual entertainment, in the same way that comics are dying for the same reason that, that movies and television do the same shit we do all the time, only much more effectively now. Um, you know, it's, I mean, you'd think, you'd think there'd be an audience for Burroughs' or stuff among 12 and 13 year olds who were, you know, creepy kids like we were. But there isn't. They don't really give a shit about it. It's too archaic. It's too, it's too ancient. I, I, I think in my heart of hearts, that's, that's where I come down on it, is it's just not, it's not embraced. It's not sought out. You know, if you, if you, as a, I mean, as a twelve-year-old kid, I, I haunted bookstores. That's you know, right. And, no shit. Right. And there were, you know, there was a paperback version of every goddamn Edgar Rice Burroughs novel and all of the knockoffs. Two or three. Um, but but for the most part, it was all there. You could buy, you know, my Burroughs, Burroughs is a used book. Burroughs. Um, Robert e. Howard, Michael Moorcock, all that stuff was and, there. And, and, and you went from one to the other. And in those days, they were they were publishing the Burroughs knockoffs. Otis Edelberg Klein, anyone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lynn uh, Carter, you know, all that Ed, stuff. Ed, oh, yeah. Ed, 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 <laughs> Edward P. Bradbury, also known as Michael Moorcock, you know. The Tarnsman of Gore, which were the bondage mm -hmm. versions of the John, John Norman. Yeah. Right. And it, uh, you know, I think there was, it was almost like a rite of passage to work your way through all that stuff. Right. And I just don't think most of that's even available anymore. Right. It's, um, it, it's look, you know, you, you walk into a Barnes and Noble, you are not going to find a shelf of the Burroughs of the Burroughs like vintage. Yeah. It's and and they're in, you know, they're in really unappealing omnibus editions right. that are maybe they have a sword on the cover, but there's no, you know, there's no Frazetta cover on the thing that to well, make I your mean, twelve year old heart go I mean, I, Well, it was the Frazetta covers on the on the. Uh, Carter books from the Science Fiction Book Club that got me to read those. And for me, seeing the Dober editions of the Venus books with those Fortune and Matani illustrations, holy shit. A guy who literally built his career illustrating the Bible, doing a Burroughs thing, doing this very literal take on, on the Burroughs, on the Burroughs material. I love this stuff. All right, so the pulps, when they were in their heyday, were for largely adults, teens to adults. Is there an equivalent today? It depends on what you're defining as an equivalent, but okay. I mean, a tremendous amount of what's published as YA books are reaching teens to adults. It's not any better written than the pulps were at the time, and a great deal of it is what I broadly define as the literature of the fantastic. You know, dealing dealing with vampires and zombies and science fiction and. Harry Potter type magic. Um, I think that's the that's the junk food for this generation, where the pulps were junk food for another generation. And you're dealing in general with a population that is structurally more literate, but not habitually more literate. I think there's a higher proportion of the American population that knows how to read better than was true certainly when 
I was I was a kid. I, but dis a, I disagree categorically. But a smaller but a smaller percentage that chooses to read and likes to read. I, I I'm not even sure I agree with that. Either. I mean I my feeling is that in an age in which information and, and knowledge was provided in ways that are more primitive than the current delivery systems. Um, I think the necessity of being, of being able to read it, not read critically, but at least read from an understanding information, was, was of, on a higher need. Um, I think people now get their information from, from in, I mean, the, the, the sub-literacy of delivery systems that happen today in, in, of supports and, 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 and perverts what's delivered. I, I, don't agree, I don't disagree with anything you're saying, Howard. I think maybe the semantic gap here is what I, what I was saying is, technically speaking, we're producing more people who know how to read. But we're not producing as many people who choose to read and exercise that skill and really learn, learn to read and use their faculties in the way that you were just talking about. I think we're producing a generation of smug, smart asses who think they were born knowing shit. <laughs> <laughs> because they can look up shit. Right. Um, I, just, look, I, just, I just made a dinner reservation on my phone. You know, while while I was I was you know ignoring my co panelists. Where we go? Uh, <laughs> you got a problem to deal with that now. Uh, <laughs> but but, but then it's somebody we're invited to dinner with. You. It is the villain. It is the villainy of this. You know yeah. that it makes. I mean, for example, Without I don't have to know anything because it's just all fucking mad. You know. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I I avoid using speed dial for that very reason because I will at least hold on to some concept of the necessity of memory. You know, I honestly think the the pulp equivalent that we have now is called Netflix. I think, huh. I, think yeah. I, I, I think it's Warcraft, and I think it's Minecraft, and I think it's Lego. Um, it's, it's binge consumption of generally uh, cheap, acceptable junk food, half, halfway entertaining material, and with and, and, with, and, some, and, and, with some high points. Scattered therein. And, I mean, I, I'm a great believer in the guilty pleasures concept. I, I, I love, I love shit. I really do. But I don't think I that my liking it or loving it makes it any good. <laughs> you know, I'm, and I, I feel we are entitled to a certain part of our appetites and our diets to be utterly unrepentant crap. Okay, uh, but yeah. but there's a difference between a guilty pleasure and not knowing it's crap. Right. Yeah, that's right. And I think we have a lot more... That's right. I mean, I mean we, most, we, have, we do have a lot more people that don't see any, right. any well, qualitative well, difference in themselves. With all due respect, uh, comic book fans tend... And I, I, when I say comic book fans, you should understand that I have a picture of myself on my bullet board at the age of 17. I weighed 265 pounds. I was the biggest comic book fan you ever saw in your life. I love comic books. I adore comic books. There's a tendency to, to conflate favorite with best. And that just because you like something that doesn't give it the imprimatur of quality, you know. I'm a big fan of pizza, but let's face it, pizza is not good. <laughs> it's very good, but it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, I mean, just the way it is. Um, I mean, it's like I, I watch enormous amounts of television. I'm obsessed with TV. I always have been. I am the character that was placed in front of the TV in, uh, in on Dream On. I'm that guy. You know, I. I my wife, it drives my wife nuts, and, um, and I love TV. And there's a lot of good TV I like, but there's also a lot of really shitty TV that I like. You read the Clive James' new book, Play All? Mm -hmm. Really got to read this. Okay. It's really good. Sorry. One of the other differences I'm seeing, based on what my panelists have been talking about, is the fact that you used to be able to get a Doc Savage every month, or you know, the Spider, or G8, or, or you know, uh, an anthology of stories. Today, you're getting a Harry Potter a year and the series ends and you're looking for the next thing or it's a trilogy. So you're not getting the same dosage and it's not becoming as much a part of you. It's a very complicated equation. You're, you're right in what you're saying, Bob, but at the same time, you're also competing in a different way. Oh, absolutely. One of the, one of the, one of the things that's certainly affecting comics today in the law of unintended consequences. It's really great that you can go and buy a graphic novel format collection of whatever the great story is. But it also, it also means that instead of your Doc Savage story or your Batman story having to compete only with being itself, because that's the only Batman story or the only Doc Savage you can buy that month, you're now competing with everything that's ever been done. Yeah. And when we were kids, you're talking about going from bookstore to bookstore to bookstore, 
talking about all the uh, Lynn Carter and other, the other boroughs knockoffs, we bought those because you couldn't easily find sometimes the real Robert E. Howard stuff. It was out of print at that moment. So this sort of looks like it. It's got swords and sorcery. I'll, and, I'll and try anything. Well, and there I mean, wasn't a huge amount of it. I mean, I can yeah. remember as a kid having read Lord of the Rings and going, what do I do now? Because right. yeah. there was nothing else. And, and then Sword of Shannara came out and you went, holy shit, there's another one. And you know, and now like my, my oldest son reads reads that stuff not voraciously, but but and I tell him, man, you have no idea. Was, <laughs> you know, you got like two of those a year, and now he's got this. You know, he can he can pick anything he wants because it's it's a smorgasbord now. I mean, I'm spoiled by the internet because I, I'm a guy who the word source brings to mind hunting through piles of books to find the gems that I needed for my collection. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I, I can still bring up the sense memory of the, of the smell of mildewed paper in a cold room in Brooklyn in 1965. It's there. It's in my head. Um, and probably right. the smell of Ruby's cigars. That's just the best. Did you all you go to the same shop? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Because um, uh, Dematis was talking about the same shop uh, earlier today. Oh, yeah, Ruby's and, and then and, and Dave's. Dave's on, Dave's on, on Ralph and St. John's. Um, yeah, you had to live in Brooklyn, apparently. I mean, these were, or, or Passaic, New Jersey. Um, but, or, I mean, or, but, but I think apparently you're right. Apparently, or, or Los Angeles was okay, too. Which one? Los Angeles was okay. There were about four, That's four or five. I, I, I got to those much too late. But yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, Ruby's and, uh, and Dave's. I met, I met Gil at Dave's, yeah. you know, in 1963. Um, you know, so. The, 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 the availability of all this material flattens out the landscape enormously. Um, and I... And there's, all, there's also a fundamental in that that perhaps we all love this material as much as we did is we spent a lot of energy pursuing it. And we got a lot of serotonin going out of that. And the, the, yeah, that the, does anybody anymore. still say, got it, needed, got it, got it, got it, needed? Yeah, sure. Got it, got it, got it, needed, got it, got it. Nobody younger than us. <laughs> yeah. So, in the couple of minutes left, are there any questions from the audience about anything we've talked about today? So, with the with the pulps, you kind of you guys were talking about you went from like places you can't access Africa or um, maybe the CD underworld, then then that transforms to comics where you've got um, gods, basically Superman. Then Marvel in the '60s has you know um, regular people who've been given superpowers. Uh, so you kind of have like this evolution going through and... And, and, a, pl and a place most people couldn't be, which was New York City. Sure. Which was mythic in its own level. Yeah, so... Certainly that, that New York City. What, what, do you, what do you think that line goes, or does it loop back around it so you can't have Tarzan in Africa, maybe you have Tarzan in space, uh, uh, Avatar, like you were saying before, you kind of... You kind of... You kind of... Right, real part. Old ideas, but in, in, a, in a way that makes it accessible again. What do you guys think? I think I think cultural amnesia is the is the dynamic, and I think everything old is new again, um, constantly. It just it's just redressed. I mean, Avatar is John Carter of Mars. Um, you know, the Bur Burroughs informs so much of what we do. So I mean, the, cr the crime stuff of the, of the 1920s and 30s informs contemporary material. Jim, if Jim, if someone had told Jim Thompson before he died that he was going to be the single most influential writer in, a, in an entire pulp, in, in a neo noir, neo pulp universe of filmmaking you know, from the from the mid '80s to the, to the early aughts, he would he would have been too drunk to believe them. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's it's all still there. It's just in a different wrapper. Um, and I think the people that are people that are doing a lot of that material now don't even know from whence it comes. That's right. Um, that doesn't change the truth of, of, of its roots, of its origins, but it just means that, that we are currently, you know, as Howard said, we have cultural amnesia about where this stuff actually comes from. It's no different in storytelling than if you sat there and you tried to trace back the fairy tales or if you tried to trace back a lot of Shakespeare's work. You know, Romeo and Juliet doesn't start with Shakespeare. These are somewhere along the line somebody tells a story that has fundamental human resonance and that becomes one of the great stories and we steal from it and we twist it and we come back to it as writers and storytellers 
along the way, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. We drape it in the clothing of our times, the things that we're interested in. I think there are a lot of reasons why the current generation is much more interested in the literature of the fantastic than the last generation. But one of them is that what I term the impossibility barrier is broken in these kids. I, I teach a lot and you know, I, I, my conversations with them, they know there's no such thing as vampires. But there could be. Somebody could have a reason for coming up with a genetically engineered virus that could make us need, need to drink blood. Okay. So, and, and we really haven't even mentioned the concept of fan fiction, yeah. which, is, which is the ultimate aspirational part of this whole project. I mean, that fucking Fifty Shades of Grey, written by that, that horrible thief, um, who basically, you know, rips, steals other characters, change, adjust, make, makes adjustments, and then, of course, demonstrates their own fraudulence by being unable to do a follow-up, you know? Um, apparently, apparently, fan fiction started with, uh, with Conan Doyle. Right. Who uh, res responded to people who wrote into him, saying, you know, you go ahead, you do a home story, see if you can do better. Uh, there's a wonderful little book, uh, Fic, uh, F-I-C, a history of fan, fan fiction that uh, follows. And, all, and, and Solar Ponds, and, you know, the, yeah. the knockoffs of Sherlock Holmes. Um, I mean, the, the, the Seven Percent Solution, which is, I think, the single best Holmes movie ever made. Um, oh, it was a pretty good novel, too. Yeah, well, I think Mike did a pretty good job, you know. Um, questions? Okay. One Interest. more question, because it's just about six. It's, it's so. the, guy, the hipster with the beard. <laughs> So we, you talked a little bit about uh, sort of that early transition from pulps to comics, and the things that got picked up, the things like The Shadow, right, uh, moving into Batman and, and some of that other uh, sort of character tradition. The things that didn't seem to get picked up, or at least in, to my awareness, things like G8 um, and, and other, some of the other genres, some of the crime fiction, the Canes, didn't, at least I haven't seen... What about Charlie Byron stuff? You know, all, you know, crime doesn't pay, justice trans the guilty, that, you know, that, that also was there. I mean, what I find interesting is the guys that I knew of that generation, like Gil and, and Jim and those guys, they were all obsessed not with the shadow, but with, with the Burroughs stuff and with Howard. I mean, when Gil did Sav, my name is, his name is Savage, he, he named it specifically. This is Conan in the Streets of New York. That's what it was. He was obsessed with Robert E. Howard, all these guys. And, and, it, and it was almost, it was too late for those guys when, when, when the Howard stuff and the Burroughs stuff was identified by the, by the comic community. They were all, like, all of them wanted to do the end. Yeah, Gil was so hard. And, and look, look at Gardner Fox. I mean, Gardner Fox rips off John Carter of Mars is, is, in 1956 or Adam Strange. Adam Strange is John Carter of Mars. Oh, wow, yeah. Is, well, I think it's, it, it's that generation and then it's our generation because we got all that stuff. Right. The paperbacks. That's we, right. The, the, the That's paperback, right. the paperback the revolution of look, the, the 60s first, and 70s. The first visual image I ever saw of Conan was by Wallace Wood. It was a cover from one of the known press editions. Oh, and, wow. and, and, and taking the description of, of Howard as, as a man with long hair, describing Conan, Conan looked like Elvis. He had a, he had a <laughs> pompadour on this cover. Love it. Okay. But Rosetta's transli transliteration of that character on the Lancer books so completely confined, defined that character that no one could step back from that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if you take a look at this Wallace Wood thing, you know, of Conan looking very much like, like William Holden or Elvis with this great conch pomp. You know, it's, it's when it's done. I think we're out of time. I thank you all for your attention. Panelists.